Welcome to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey of Kiss Organics. This is the podcast where we discuss the cutting edge of organic growing from a science-based perspective and draw on top experts from around the industry to share their wisdom and knowledge. This podcast was a fun one for me because we got to talk about some of the challenges around researching cannabis, how to interpret that research, a recent white paper comparing single plant versus communal plant systems and soils, and also announce a new partnership. My guest this week is Ben Higgins. Ben earned his PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology from the University of California, Santa Cruz, where he studied functional ecology, organismal morphometrics, and physiology. He is the chief research scientist at Goldleaf Gardens, where he collects data on various topics in coordination with multiple companies representing all corners of the cannabis industry. Ben works alongside their experienced staff to refine, research, and develop new methods in organic cannabis cultivation. He lives in Olympia, Washington with his wife and two daughters and loves to explore the natural beauty of the area with them as often as possible. Now on to the show. Hey Ben, welcome to the show. Thanks, Todd. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, let's start off by letting, telling listeners a little bit about you and your background and how you ended up over at Goldleaf Gardens. Sure. Um, so just kind of like everything else has been so far in my life, nothing's really exactly linear. Most of my background actually comes from um, marine-based research. So um, this all kind of started out back really in uh, my undergrad that I did at Pitzer College. Um, I went abroad to the Great Barrier Reef and stayed there for five weeks and did a bunch of independent study work and, you know, just live in the, the island life and had a blast and, and really just got hooked on kind of studying the natural world. And as that was my first experience with it, I kind of just gravitated towards marine life, you know, ichthyology, so studying fishes. And, you know, I, 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 I was living still and going to college still in California, so coral reefs really weren't, you know, that available to keep working on when I got home. But kelp forests were right outside the back door, and I eventually um, got linked up with a principal investigator up at UC Santa Cruz and did my dissertation on um, California moray eels and really kind of evolved myself um, into what is kind of described as a functional ecologist. And what that means is really it's just about understanding the organisms in a system and how they interact with that system and with each other. Um, so I then kind of took a big shift and uh, moved, once I finished my program, moved up here to Olympia and started working at Goldleaf, where uh, it, was, it was fun. It was, it was a little bit of a challenge to take things that were happening kind of on a larger scale underwater and starting to try to figure out how to apply those to much smaller things that were happening in the soils. So instead of looking at a bunch of different fishes and what they ate and how those species interacted, I started to kind of shift my focus to the things that you'd find in soils, right? So bacteria, um, all the other small little, you know, things that are moving around in there and some of the bigger things and just looking at the trophic interactions there and learning that these are all kind of dials that you can really kind of turn and then your results aren't necessarily the the species interaction themselves but the plants as an indicator of those interactions right so your healthy plant is going to be a great measuring stick on of the biology that's happening you know beneath them um, if the biology is looking great then you're going to see that result as a healthy plant if the biology under there is imbalanced or the diversity is low or not so healthy then you'll see that kind of manifest in the plant. So it was really a cool system to, to kind of, you know, moved into, and I'm still learning as I go, and that's why I still love doing this stuff is I just keep learning and, you know, expanding, and uh, that's how I kind of ended up at, at Goldleaf. Now, when you came into Goldleaf, you didn't have any experience growing cannabis. Is that correct? That's correct. I, I had some experience growing plants beyond just, you know, I wanted some tomatoes for my salad. 
Um, I, I did do a years and years ago. I did a little bit of a uh, an internship at um, a nursery down in Southern California, but I was taking care of things like coastal live oaks and you know your kind of the the endemic species down there, the native species down there, and um, it, nothing even remotely close to cannabis production. So what I think is interesting is with your background being in science and scientific research, it really gave you a good, a good head start in understanding um, sort of how to approach data collection in a facility like, like gold leaf. So I guess what I would wonder, what I would wonder from you is given your background and as you came into this whole thing, um, what what were you finding were some of the challenges around data collection, and what were some of the the metrics that you found were really important in evaluating uh, sort of the you know the business overall or the health of the plants? Right. So it I got kind of lucky because of the way Gold Leaf's facility is set up. Um, it's basically seven replicate rooms, and to a scientist, replicates are are a gold mine, right? Because then you can start playing with different things and, you know, different variables and then holding other variables constant. And if you can do that across multiple different rooms that are identical, you can start to get a lot of power to really, you know, figure out what's, what's going on. Um, the first time I saw the Gold Leaf facility, I was, I was like, oh my gosh, this is, this is you know, a, a functioning laboratory as much as it is a functioning, you know, cannabis facility. And <clears throat> I told that to Nate Gibbs, the owner there, and um, he was very interested in, in, you know, having me come on and, you know, try to, you know, turn some of these dials and, and, and get down to researching this. Um, as far as the challenges are concerned, this is all coming because, coming from the, the, the fact that I just spent six years kind of working at my own pace, you know, kind of investigating any lead that I might find interesting, um, you know, just chasing the rabbit down whichever hole, you know, the questions or the data might lead you. But when you're working within the, you know, the guidelines of a facility, you know, you need to kind of navigate that a little bit differently, right? Because you can't just say like, well, you know, to answer this question, I'm going to need six years, and I don't know where it's going to go, right? That's not a sustainable model to try to fit within a business. So um, it took a little time to figure out the sweet spot, and I, I still am, about trying to figure out kind of not the, the lowest possible amount of data to analyze, but uh, the, what, would give us, what would give us the most amount of statistical power in the shortest amount of time to answer some of these questions. So you know, things that I would like to do at a, you know, a slower pace or collect as much data as possible. I need to maybe truncate a little bit and maybe collect the same amount of data just in a shorter amount of time. So that's just more repeated measurements of things rather than a longer duration. And just the harvest cycle itself, right, will really kind of determine, you know, how much time you have to collect some of these data and then after that, it's just a matter of, well, that was one round. Let's try this again, uh, maybe with some different strains or different phenotypes, right, and, and, and go at it again. So um, it's been, again, a, a new learning experience for me to, to take research and kind of find its way through the kind of um, the environment, really, that, that is a, a functioning, you know, tier two business uh, cannabis production. Yeah, so I say I think what you're hinting at is the fact that you have a commercial facility that's a for-profit business that you're trying to balance the sort of data collection and research that you're doing with the fact that uh, you also have to be profitable just to right. just to stay in business. And when I look at data collection, and correct me on anything here as we go, uh, the, I think the important thing to keep in mind is that it's it's really good to identify what metrics are important to collect right. first of all. So. The first thing is to identify what what data do we want to collect, and how do we isolate that data to make sure that it it's useful. So if we're you know if we're just looking at yield, there's so many variables that go into yield. That number is useful in seeing 
you know, how the business is, is growing in terms of the, the plant cycle, but it's not really telling us why it doesn't tell us if it was the environment. It doesn't tell us if it was the soil or the nutrient level or the watering, all of these factors. So, uh, really having to isolate each of those variables in a, you know, a functioning facility, I think is a, is a real challenge like you're, like you're getting at there. Right. And I, I, another way to put it would be you're, you know, we're, we're really, so far I've seen, we're really trying to just investigate the pattern, right? Like increasing yields would be a really nice pattern to pick up on. How do we get these yields to get bigger? How do we get, is it the bud size? Is it more buds per plant? Is it a better ratio between dry weight to wet weight? Like there's all these different ways you can get at a better yield. The stuff that gets trickier is when you're trying to nail down the, the, um, the mechanism, right? What's the biological cause and effect here for why we're getting the bigger buds or why we're getting more buds per plant or why we're getting the better, you know, ratio between dry, dry weight to wet weight. So it's the, the why of it is really kind of that the, the, the drilling down on the actual biological mechanism is what can really take you down a very long, long uh, arduous path of, you know, hunting down different variables, throwing out ones that you've tested, and then refining your approach, refining your hypotheses, and going and going and going. And of course, everything's got a price, right? And if you find that you do this one thing, and it's like, oh my God, the yields went up, you know, some incredibly statistically significant amount, then maybe it is worth the time and effort to really try to find that one mechanism that's causing that. But until then, it's really just kind of you're trying to change variables to keep a consistent pattern of increasing most likely yield, which, like you said, will will turn into increased profitability. So one of the things, let's talk about this first experiment. So you wrote this uh, white paper that uh, I got to assist on uh, from <laughs> down at Goldleaf. And yep. the 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 paper was really uh, it was comparing plants grown in isol isolated containers versus communal bed systems. So gold leaf has been growing in uh, essentially these raised beds for years now, using the same soil over and over uh, and reamending it. But you wanted to see what would happen if we went to containers because containers are a lot easier to move around the facility. Um, there's a lot of pros and cons to both both options. So. Can we talk a little bit about uh, your hypothesis and then also uh, some of the, the challenges in, in setting up the methodology? Yeah, of course. So the general hypothesis, right, is, is organisms like to be around other organisms, particularly plants. And there's a lot of research that I'm really just starting to scratch the surface on as far as plants not only recognizing that there are other plants around, but they can understand the identity of those plants around. And if those plants that are neighboring them, they are of the same species or conspecifics, they will actually behave in altruistic behaviors, right? So they'll actually sacrifice some of their own energy to alert plants of the same species nearby that there's a pest or something's going on or, you know, there's some kind of other ailment um, or perturbation in the system. Um, so that's all really cool. And then, you know, you've heard of this, or some people may have heard of this kind of word get thrown around about what's called tree talk, which is, you know, trees can share these um, ectomycorrhizal fungus associations for miles and miles and miles. Um, so they're communicating in the soil using these kind of fungal networks, right? So there's a whole host of different again, mechanisms that may help um, assist plants in figuring out, well, is this neighbor next to me going to hurt me? Am I going to have to compete with it? Am I going to have to attack it? Am I going to have to defend myself from it? Or is this a like species that I'll be able to actually share a network with to promote growth or health or resiliences? So the hypothesis was to you know, we would we expected that plants that of the same species, right, particularly even the same strains, would actually work together um, when grown in these living soil beds rather than when they're grown in isolation, 
and don't have the opportunity to share information through network. Um, other research has been done where even plants touching another plant, um, you know, literally rubbing up against another plant can induce stress levels or, you know, other kinds of, of responses. So what we did was um, we used a system that Gold Leaf's been using, like you said, for four years. And it's important to note that we're not starting out with fresh soil here. We're starting out with very well-aged and advanced soil, I guess you could say. Um, what is important to note that is we use the same soil in both the beds and the pots, right? So this is all coming from the same source. Um, so we took um, these beds and we put six plants in each bed, and then those six plants were then contained in one trellis, which kind of helps with secondary growth and, and support as they go. And we took six plants and put them individually in 12-gallon pots, and then those six plants would share a trellis as well. And then we just would try to control or hold constant all the other variables, right? So, and the best way to do that is to have them try to share a space as close as possible. I mean, we all know that lighting, um, lighting spectrum, lighting intensity can change pretty rapidly, um, even moving around the same room. So we wanted to have these beds and these pots kind of side by side to try to hold that constant, try to control for that. Um, waterings were all done at the same times and at the same levels. So watering was held constant. And then, of course, they were all harvested uh, at the same time and the wet weights were measured at the same time. So that was kind of the methodology and the hypothesis behind that. So, Ben, many people would look at a, a trial like this and just say something like, well, duh, I mean, we all know that plants would like to be in beds over pots, but I think it's important that we do try and test these things out to actually see if they're true. Cause there's a lot of examples in science where we take things for granted as being, uh, as being true without ex actually testing them out. In fact, Tim Wilson, uh, with microbe organics who I've had on the podcast was sort of the one that really opened my eyes to that in a lot of ways around things with compost tea. Yeah. I mean, Sorry. Yeah, though it's it's a really good point because it's it, kind of a aside, but to your point, it, my whole PhD on Maury eels started out asking these really kind of advanced questions as far as larval dispersal and ocean currents and genetic makeups of populations and all these really kind of like questions that you would expect to answer or to ask at least you know in this kind of in this day and age of you know, marine research. And as I was doing the background research to try to just lay the foundation to answer those questions, I was finding pothole after pothole after just non-existent pothole of, of, of information on really basic things, um, such as how old can a moray get? What do they eat? How often do they move? How much do they move? How many can occur in a given area? And like all of these kind of very fundamental, basic natural history, biological questions had not been answered. And it took me six months to find the answer to how old does a California moray live? I mean, you would look around on museum or uh, aquarium websites, you know, just kind of general info and you'd get, oh, they could live to be about almost 30 years. Okay, great. Well, where did that data come from? What, what's the source on this, right? That's what you always got to try to figure out is who did the study, when was it done, and so forth. And it took me six months to trace down. It, it turned out that that age of a moray came from a single individual that was living in a tank, and it got published. I mean, this was back in the early 70s. So just based on that single anecdotal non-representation of a natural population, we had this kind of data point that's laid the framework for decades of this is how old Amore can be. And I think the cannabis industry is at the same point where you have been, you know, it's, everybody's been researching cannabis in their own way, in their own backyard, in their own, you know, what have you. 
But it's gotten to the point where it's scaled up so much that really understanding these questions and collecting the right data can make really big financial, have really big financial implications, right? So I think it's really the, the whole how to grow cannabis, whether it be organically or hydroponically or what have you, is at a kind of a really big turning point right now where the data really needs to start being collected on things that maybe we've always taken for granted because we really don't know outside of maybe some anecdotal stuff if that's really true or not. Yeah, so I want to... I want to touch on a, a, some of these things within the experimental design really quickly and then get into what you found for the results. So essentially you were using beds that were custom made. They were three feet by three and three quarter feet by uh, three quarter feet tall. So all of this will be in the white paper and you can go on to the website at kissorganics.com. It'll be uh, the latest blog post and I'll also put links up to it on the podcast page. So each plant had in the container it looks like it worked out to 1.55 cubic feet of soil per plant. And then in the bed, it worked out to 1.41 cubic feet of soil per plant. So you actually had more soil per plant in the, uh, bed, in, this, in the pot than you did in the communal bed. Right. Yeah, and then when we look at it, lighting was the same, watering was the same, all of the things that you mentioned were the same. And then your uh, metric was the wet weight because unfortunately in the way your facility processes, you weren't able to collect dry weights accurately because things get moved around. Right. It, it, it involved kind of tracing the same bud through a host of different processes and across many different, you know, employees handling it. And then that's just one of those things that you know, again, if, if the if the cost really is there and it's <clears throat> excuse me, it makes the it makes financial sense to really track this kind of data down, then that's one thing. But again, first pass at an exploratory study kind of such as this, it, it you know, it didn't really didn't really make sense to try to mess up the workflow, so to speak, to 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 try to track down that kind of data. Yeah, and so then you took the information that you gathered, the data, and you ran it through a significant Tukey's honest significant test, which frankly, I don't really understand myself. <laughs> so I don't want to get into it too much. Uh, but the long story short was you threw out one outlier in your data, the um, Koloa sunrise that actually right. yielded really well in the beds. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. So it wasn't actually thrown out. Um, the reason I, I decided not to throw it out is because there wasn't actually a statistically different uh, a significantly different uh, result between the, the homogenous bed or the cloth pot for the close sunrise. Um, you can see it. Um, that's in the, in the in the white paper. You'll see grateful breath, the which was found to be significant, has a little asterisk above the two bars, which would indicate that grateful breath actually grew significantly better in homogenous beds than it did in the cloth pots. But Koloa, uh, while it did grow much better, it wasn't significantly better. Had it been significant, then kind of you go through this decision tree. Well, is it significant because of this weird outlier bed that did really good? And in which case you remove that and then you run the test again. And then if it's significant, then you can keep it in there. If it's not significant, then you kind of go back to your experimental design and figure out, well, what's the question I'm asking? Is this one outlier truly an outlier? And then you get into the whole, I need more data kind of marathon um, to really make sure that it wasn't an outlier. Maybe it's just, you know, if we had another bed that was between the mean or the average for the homogenous bed for Kaloa Sunrise and that outlier, then all of a sudden that outlier doesn't become an outlier, it just becomes the maximum value for that group. So um, that's kind of the way the statistics work for this one. Um, like I said, grateful breath was significantly better in homogenous beds. Um, however, all of the three strains we tested did perform better. And it kind of brings up another interesting point where the fields of statistics and academia maybe clash a little bit with, you know, business practices, right? Because if you're growing something and it's better, but it's not significantly better, then it really comes down to, you know, an ROI or return on investment kind of question where, 
you know, is it worth investing this many resources to get this much better? And there you go, you have your decision. But at least this kind of data does show that, well, yeah, if I have to spend a little bit more on beds than pots, for example, I will at least recoup this money faster because the plants will be growing better. Yeah, now this this white paper is far from perfect. Uh, <laughs> I'll be fair to, to be fair, uh, and this is something we've talked about in at length. So one of the things that that we talked about was that it really would be good to measure dry weight. Now, yeah. visually, I think you commented to me that the buds looked very comparable in terms of the ratio of uh, you know sort of leaf matter to to buds, but that would be you know in theory you could have a result where the homogeneous bed produced a lot of leaf matter, but much smaller buds. And so your dry weight, which is your actual metric could be much lower, but right. um, in this case, we weren't able to, and then also, you know, replication. So that's the other thing with science is if you're able to create this result in your, in this, in gold leaf facility, you'd want to replicate it again in gold leaf, but you'd also want to replicate it in other facilities, you know, in other locations. Yeah, absolutely. And, and using, Right to to really test the, the 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 question you're really trying to get at is, do I want to grow my plants together or do I want to grow them separately? So you would really even want to try to grow plants in brand new soil, right? As opposed to what we have at Gold Leaf, which is this you know aged, you know reused, reamended, um, kind of sustained medium, because then you could say, well, I test now the medium becomes a non-factor, right? If you switch the medium completely and you still get the same result, then you're still on that, that picking up that right pattern, right? Well, it's like, well, it's not the, you know, secret sauce of having really old, high biodiverse soil because I got the same results, you know, using brand new soil. So then, then, then you start to gather more power to kind of supporting your hypothesis, right, where you test as many different combinations of as many different variables, just try to nail down that one question, right? Um, so, even, again, you could try different watering techniques, and you could try different lighting sources, and if you still get that same result, then you gain in confidence in saying, there really is something here about growing a plant among neighbors rather than in isolation. Um, a lot of the paper, too, talks about, um, you know, what's happening underneath the soil, you know, active mycorrhizal networks and um, communication between plants and things like that. Another great variable that would be fantastic to measure would be uh, the root mass, right? Like, do we see that these roots are, you know, putting out a lot more biomass, you know, in a bed, reaching out to neighbors as opposed to um, in, in isolation where there, there's really nothing to, to handshake with, right? And then you really got to get into, <laughs> well, is it the plants that they're going after or are they just exploring more soil, right? Because then you're starting to get into surface area to volume ratios about, you know, a plant maybe feels an edge of a pot differently than it feels the edge of a bigger volume of soil. So these are all the, the, the like I said, the, the, the rabbit holes that you can quickly find yourself um, getting down, which are all incredibly interesting scientifically and, and biologically. But when it does come down to how is my business going to stay open, make more money, those things don't always align. Yeah, so this is really a good starting point for people in exploring this idea of plant communities um, in a growing space or in a growing area. And I think you're right. So if we wanted to gain more confidence in that, the fact that what is allowing for this plant growth is really the communal aspect of these plants, then we would want to grow in cocoa using a nutrient line, for example, or chelated ionic nutrients, or we'd want to grow, you know, um, in, in, in other media and in other methods and see if we can replicate that same result. But ultimately, at the end of the day, if you're running a facility, you don't really care as much about that. You just care about what your results are in your facility. So go, for gold leaf, in this case, growing in these communal beds makes sense based yep, on the results. Absolutely. And that's the, that's the one thing that we can probably take away from this 
this white paper more than anything. And uh, I think that's important. So if you're doing research, you're, you're looking at ways you can profit off of this. And for Goldleaf, you know, you're going to profit more by continuing to grow in the manner that you were, I guess, is essentially what we came to. Yep, exactly. And again, this is, these are three out of the, you know, almost at least hundreds of strains we have currently at Goldleaf. And you can see already we have a one strain that did significantly better and the other two were not significantly better. So that right there is a question, why grateful breath? And of course, there's going to be just some genetics involved there. But, you know, when you get into, well, why does the genetics of grateful breath respond significantly better and the other two do not? And, you know, you can ask these questions until you're blue in the face and and then all of a sudden it's six years later and you're trying to finish a PhD program. Um, but that's, that's how science works. And that's how you, you, really, you really know if you're doing it well, if at the end of an experiment you have more questions than when you started. The, the, the uncovering of a pattern or a mechanism really does open doors that, if done correctly, you didn't even know were there yet because you didn't let the data tell you where the different results could come from, right? You don't know if it's the bed or the pot or if it's the plant or the genetics or the, you know, go on and on and on. But when you do the data collection right, you get all these interesting patterns and you, you want to figure out why. Why is this this way? And then off you go. Yeah, that's great. Let's, uh, since we have a few of these papers to kind of talk about and a couple other things we want to mention, uh, let's go ahead and move on to talk a little bit about uh, the blue mats and some of your results there. So, yeah. Oh, probably about, what was it, six months ago, eight months ago, um, we got some blue mats set up at Gold Leaf to compare the hand watering that was going on at Gold Leaf with an automated irrigation system like blue mats, where the plant really controls, controls the watering process based on the, the moisture content of the soil. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, that experiment? Yeah, so we were, it was great. We got some, uh, enough blue mat material to run basically 11 of the, of the beds that um, we have in, in a given room. And we wanted to see if we could maybe save a little bit of time on labor and if the plants responded, you know, better, the same, worse. We really didn't know. Um, at Goldleaf, it's a very much uh, hands-on, you know, organic craft mentality. So all of the plants are at least visually seen once a day, if not more than that. There's a very intimate relationship between the gardeners and, and the plants there. So hand watering is something that's a daily multi, you know, it happens all the time. So it takes a bit of time. Um, and, you know, we we plant strains in homogeneous beds, meaning so you have one strain per bed, but you have in one bed, you'll have, you know, uh, pineapple mimosa, for example, and then in the next bed, you'll have um, animal sherbet too, right next to it. So when someone's going around watering, you're really kind of watering by experience and by either feel or by visual inspection, right? Well, that looks damp or pick up a clump of dirt and mush it around and well, that feels dry. And so you water accordingly. But as anybody knows, you know, <laughs> my dry may be different than your dry and your wet might be my damp. Um, so there's a lot of room for um, error, even in a, amongst experienced gardeners, right? So what this blue mats does is it kind of allows the plant to be the captain of its own watering needs, right? It gets to make that decision for itself. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to put a bunch of these different strains side by side as we normally do and run a blue mass supply line with um, some blue soak drip tape through them. And uh, just opposite them, we would run the same setup just without the blue mats. So it would be the same strains mirrored on either side of this aisle so, for example, the right aisle would be 11 or so different strains, and on the left side would be the same strains, just not, you know, fitted with the blue mat system and hand-watered. 
So we did that, and, you know, those were installed, I think, the day after the plants were transplanted um, into, the, into the beds, and those were installed, and I would go around and make sure that the, the soil moisture was kind of hanging around right at 100 M bar, kind of as a, you know, as a previous discussion I had with you about what, the, what that kind of soil makeup would, would benefit from. And we let those things just run. Um, the beds that were retrofitted with blue mats did uh, receive additional inputs, um, you know, whether it's compost teas or different, you know, feeding regimes and stuff. So that was done outside of the blue mat system because if you try to throw too much organic material through those, you know, tight lines and stuff, they can get fouled up pretty quickly. And then you're you're having some not favorable things getting watered into your beds. Um, so it was just strictly water that was going through the blue mat system, which means that both the blue mats and the non blue mats beds were getting were receiving the identical feeding regimes, which is which is again great because it's something you want to hold constant. Um, so yeah, it was a it was a really cool experiment. We let the beds run all the way to flower, and then again, similarly to the pots versus beds white paper, we just kind of uh, stopped data collection at the above ground biomass or, or the wet weights and just compared those. Yeah. So I know you tried out a couple different designs here for the blue mats too, and you got a little bit of data from that. But the main thing was just comparing hand watering versus an automated system like blue mats, because I, th I think it's important to distinguish between automated irrigation systems too, because even with these ones that are on timers, we're still they're still we're still manually um, as a human telling the plant when it wants or needs water. Whereas with this blue mat system, we're just maintaining the moisture content at the at a current level that we establish. And I want to give credit to Giant Palmer for the hundred M bar mark. That was something that he came up with through his research. Uh, I'd like to test out some different, you know, it'd be good to repeat this and look at, you know, 110 M bar and 90 or, or what range is, is possibly optimal. But as of right now, I think a hundred is a great starting point. And, yeah. uh, you know, let's talk a little bit about your results. So what did you find, uh, using the automated watering, the blue mats versus your hand waters? And I do want to emphasize that the guys that we had hand watering for this experiment, I know a lot of them personally, I've known them for years. Uh, they're, excellent at their jobs and they're, they know how to grow cannabis. And, uh, it's, it's not just like some random hires off the road that are watering plants. You know, some of these guys have been doing it for decades. So yeah, super committed to the craft and just absolutely love the plant. So it, it was great to be able to have that to compare something like this too, as opposed to, like you said, just someone who, you know, looks at a, at the soil and sees, sees if it's gray or black. Um, so kind of in short, the, it was actually pretty surprising. Every, uh, so we tested five strains. We tested uh, birthday cake, pineapple mimosa, animal sherbet to uh, wedding cake, and mimosa. And all but mimosa had way more biomass at the end of the harvest cycle than the non-blue mat, um, non mat replicates so, or treatment. So, for example, um, wedding cake averaged about, so this, again, is a, a trellis weight of about, uh, uh, this is eight plants now. Uh, we bumped up the, the plants per bed for this. Uh, so we were getting about six pounds per trellis for the blue mat bed for wedding cake. And the non-blue mat bed, we had a double, couple of different controls running, so we averaged those, and we were getting just north of four pounds per eight plants. So that right there is roughly a 20, almost, almost 30% increase in, a, in, in above ground biomass, um, which is, was pretty shocking to me at least. And it was, it was shocking to everybody else there. We really didn't expect to see that kind of bump um, just basically on letting the plants kind of take the water when they felt they needed it. Right. So I think, again, this will be something that we need to test more of. In fact, we're doing that right now. We loved the result. Um, we probably did save a little bit of money as far as laboring goes, or at least we were able to focus the the attention of the employees on something a little bit more delicate than than, than watering. Um, and we want to again see how this works across strains, and if if the result holds up, then that's that's pretty great. Um, 
I think the the awesome thing about having a bunch of different strains side by side again is you'll have the plant dictate what it needs, right? So this is kind of concept of, of homeostasis, right? Where like for, for human, for example, if you get too hot, you're going to start getting outside of that thermal neutral zone and you're going to start sweating. If you get too cold, you start slipping away from your happy spot, your, your, you know, your, your set point on your thermostat and you start to shiver. So I wouldn't be surprised if there was the same kind of homeostasis envelope for a plant, for example, right? And those can be dialed a little differently, even across strains where, you know, one plant might be great, like you said, at 110 MBAR would be ideal. And, you know, plus 50, minus 50 below that, they're okay. But if it does dip below that for, or above that for a little, you might see the plant, you know, start to stress out a little bit. And what these blue mats do is that allows the there's just a constant supply of water and the plants get to dictate when they when they need a drink so the results are are pretty intriguing um and promising certainly enough to merit a second run which like i said we're we're doing right now yeah i think one of the things interesting here with this with the mimosa is that uh it makes me wonder if maybe it would be curious to measure what if plants that are hand watered versus plants that are watered with a blue mat to figure out exactly how much water those plants are getting in those beds and then say, okay, well maybe the mimosa needs less water just because that particular cultivar, you know, for example, likes less water or slightly drier soils. But I think the main benefit of this of blue mats is maintaining the moisture content uh, at a level where we get a lot of microbial activity. Because uh, like you said, that, that idea of homeostasis, when it gets too cold, the microbes slow down. When it gets too hot, uh, you have similar issues. And, you, and then you have root problems with the, with the plant itself. So I, I was surprised. I thought you were going to save on labor. I did not think you would get that much of a bump in uh, yield. Yeah, us too. So we were, we're all pretty excited about it. And again, we're, we're going with a bunch of different strains for this next round. And we're, we're going to keep the same setup um, as we had before so we can compare these data across studies. We don't want to change, you know, the designs or the variables because then you're introducing a bunch of different, vari bunch of different variables and a bunch of variability between studies, in which case you can't com start to compile this, this big data set, right? You want to keep the way you collect the data the same, the methodology the same, even if it is across rounds because that way you can compare these data to previous rounds. Um, which is super important because otherwise these just become tiny little standalone experiments when in fact we want to have a big kind of overarching data set that spans rooms, that spans strains and time. And again, the, the way to do that is to hold how you collect the data constant. And uh, I just want to throw in a real quick shameless sales pitch here. So if you are interested in blue mats, I think Ben and I have worked out some really great designs and uh, Ben is actually helping me now with the blue mat designs and everything. So if you're interested in a custom blue mat setup for, you know, whether it's, it's beds or containers or greenhouse or outdoor fields, uh, please shoot, shoot me an email and uh, I'll put you in touch with Ben and we can get something set up for you. We're working with a variety of different designs right now for people. And it's, uh, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, it's a blast. It's really cool. Great. Well, I know you have a couple other papers that you're, or trials that you're running right now in the facility uh, that you, we haven't quite gotten all the data on yet, but I wanted to just mention them since I'm going to have you on the phone here and we'll, we'll get you back on possibly to talk about them when the papers are done. But tell me a little bit about your experience with uh, Mammoth P. I know you guys got some samples from them and you started playing around with it and uh, we're collecting some data. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, totally. The, the folks over at Mammoth P were, were super gracious and gave us um, about a gallon of their stuff to kind of poke around and play around with. Um, and it was, we, we were, we've tested many different kind of microbial and mycorrhizal concoctions um, before. So we had a, a good system set up already for um, testing this um, already in place. So we, we, the, the, 
the label actually does a really great job of making it, you know, the instructions are basically on how often and how much the dilution ratios and, and when to apply it. So um, we wanted to get this stuff into the ground and into the plants as fast as possible. Um, so we didn't really start it off with a, like I would say, a controlled kind of methodol methodological setup. We just kind of said, let's get it in there and see what happens. So this is, you know, some preliminary data that's, again, not really set up, you know, like a full-blown scientific experiment. Um, but even with that one run in that one room, we got about a 12% bump in wet weight harvests across all strains uh, using mammoth pea as a, as a kind of soil microbial additive. Um, so we're, we're trying to work with the folks in mammoth pea to, to maybe get a little bit more soil and do a, a, a really robust um, trial with that because that's a very easy thing to figure out as far as well, if I buy this much, but I get this much in return, it's a very easy cost-benefit analysis to run um, to do that. So the Mammoth Pea trials are still ongoing as well. Um, again, the <laughs> Gold Leaf facility has, has morphed into this awesome lab and, and, and just being able to test all these different products and, and get some data behind these things has, has been really, really cool. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing the research on that. I was a little bit surprised. I mean, I I looked at the Mammoth Pea under the microscope. It's one of the only microbial products on the market that I'm aware of that's bottled and still has motile bacteria, which I think is cool. Um, it's, uh, I did do a, a video on YouTube brewing it and adding a variety of food sources to see if I could increase the biology in there um, and maintain the same microorganisms. And it looked like at least three of the four survived, but um, I know they don't necessarily encourage that. Uh, I, I was, uh, I was quite impressed though, that you got the results that you did. I do see a lot of soil tests where the Malik three test, which is the one that kind of tells you everything that's in the soil uh, will show very high levels of phosphorus. I see levels upwards of 700 to a thousand pounds per acre. Sometimes it's crazy. Uh, way more than any, way, way, way more than you need. And then you'll see very low available phosphorus, whether it's because of the pH or because you don't have the right microbes to make the phosphorus available for the plant. Um, that's where I think mammoth pea is a, is a really interesting option for people. Yeah, I agree. I, I think the, the way we're kind of looking at it is, right, we, we have these kind of big macronutrients sitting in the soil. And just by kind of increasing the the chefs, so to speak, right? The little, the little cooks that can make this stuff and chop these things up and make them more readily available to the plants uh, at a faster rate may be what, what we're seeing here drive these, these yields just a little bit better. Yeah. And uh, Mammoth Pea is something that we, you know, Colin's, Colin's an old friend. I really like the company um, and what he's doing. And so, uh, yeah, please don't hesitate to reach out to on the Mammoth Pea thing if people are interested in finding out more or, um, or I might be able to get get them to send you a sample or I can send you a sample if you're local because uh, they dropped some off just the other day in our store. So uh, wonderful. So let's talk about uh, the one that I think I'm most excited for, which is this, uh, I, g generically, you could say it's an LED versus HPS conversation, but more specifically, uh, we, we have some lights that you guys set up from BIOS lighting, which is, uh, I've had Rebecca on the podcast. They're the, the NASA founded LED company and, uh, your current technology, which was uh, double ended HPS. Cause you guys were kind of, when Nate first set up the facility, there really wasn't the, uh, research around LEDs and the price point was so high. Right. Um, and now he's looking, now you guys are looking into what's the cost benefit of switching over to LEDs. And I think this is a really interesting trial and a question that a lot of people, uh, want to know the answer to like, are they worth the additional cost? Yeah, it was great. Rebecca actually came at Go Leaf a couple of weeks ago and, and her and I sat down and, and came up with these really, you know, kind of elaborate different ways we can try to get at the, the, you know, how well an LED does for a certain plant for cannabis. And it was just a total nerd out session. <laughs> it was, it was great. Um, and, uh, we, we actually started with kind of working backwards, right. Where again, 
me and her could go down any which way path to find the mechanisms for, you know, is it spectrum, is it chlorophyll profiles, all this kind of stuff. But really what what folks want to know is, am I going to grow more? Am I going to grow better quality? Um, and if I do, how much do I have to grow to recoup what I spent on top of what I could normally have spent on, you know, some, some older, you know, cheaper technology? So the first thing we're going to do is we're coming out with a, a white paper here pretty soon where we've actually analyzed some of our um, electricity, like our utility load data, to try to parse out how many cycles, how many harvests we would need in order to recoup the price of installing um, these BIOS lights in one of our rooms. So that hopefully should be coming out here pretty soon. And then the next one we're doing um, – is actually just going to be another uh, another trial of you know setting up. We have it's eight of these BIOS lights in one of the flower rooms, and all around the outer edge um, are the the old kind of HPS fixtures. Uh, we did put brand new bulbs in those though, so we could try to get you know as as even of a comparison as possible. Where if you say I'm going to buy brand new this or brand new that, again you want to make sure that you're not you know. I, want to, I don't want to compare a brand new BIOS to an HPS that's been hanging there for two or three years, right? Because that's not a totally fair comparison. Um, so we put brand new bulbs in all of the, you know, the the, the HPS lights that we're going to run against the, the BIOS. Um, and then this time, though, we, we did come up with some kind of a, a data collection workflow that we will be able to target um, the dry weights for the strains in, in this flower room. So we're going to make sure we don't only have the harvest weight, but we want to see that wet weight, that harvest weight translate into sellable actual product and see if, if that actually um, makes a difference. So that, those lights were put up there um, oh, a couple months ago now. So the end of the harvest for that one room uh, should be happening here in the next couple weeks in which case we have um, our controls already set up. So we want to make sure that the mothers are treated the same. We want to make sure that the clones are treated the same. We want to make sure that, you know, the young vegetative stages are treated the same. And then the only possible difference would be when exposed to the BIOS lights or the SPH lights with the new bulbs once they get transferred into that flower room. And that should be happening here, like I said, in the next uh, two or three weeks. And then you're also randomizing those clones too. So you're not setting aside at the very beginning, these ones are going to go under BIOS because they look great and these are going to go under right. HPS. You're, you're randomizing yeah, it all. It's funny how easy um, human bias can kind of creep in there where, you know, you it's not even a purposeful thing, right, to say, well, I want, you know, if I'm going to spend the money on the BIOS lights, I want these results to look good. And then almost subconsciously you're going to look and put all those, you know, the best, tallest clones under the BIOS lights. So one of the things we're going to be doing is we're going to actually be, yeah, like you said, randomizing the clones. So let's say we're going to be using 120 plants. Each one of those 120 plants are going to get assigned a number, and then that number will be um, thrown into a randomly generated number sequence. And then those will decide which of the clones goes into under the BIOS lights treatment and which of the clones go under the the HPS light treatment. So again, it is, it's, you just want to try to weed out and get rid of as many of the biases or preconceived kind of notions to try to really get down to the core data for the question you're asking. Yeah, now tell me about what you're seeing anecdotally so far, because I know you have already flowered some plants under the BIOS lights, but you didn't weren't set up to actually collect that data. And I realize there's issues around uh, lighting intensity and getting the plants used to a different spectrum. So those things can all affect it, but. So, yeah, it's pretty interesting. I, I poked my head into this, to this room the other day and I, I was pretty taken aback by how tall the plants were that were under the full spectrum of the BIOS lights. Meaning, you know, the BIOS lights, because they're LEDs, they have a little bit more of a focused area that they cover, right? There's not such a splash zone uh, that you might get with an HPS. So, if you're off center or you know offset a certain amount of feet from these lights, the, the the intensity goes down pretty quick. And we actually just happen to have three of the same strains grown 
next to each other in three different in you know three different beds, and the ones that were fully under the bio slides were probably a good foot and a half to two feet taller than the ones that were grown just out of the reach of the bio slides and kind of under this probably mixed spectrum of LED and HPS kind of wash out you know ambient kind of light. So the, they look much, much bigger. Now, of course, we want to make sure that, you know, bigger means better, and that's why we really got to target the wet weights, right, where if we're getting taller plants, that might be great, but if you've got more internodal spacing and they get stretchy, you might not actually get the result you're looking for. You might have less buds or not as big, um, you know, stuff like that. So that's why the data you really, you, you know, you want to capture does – really get at the question because like like you really even saying bigger is not always better you know bigger might be great but if it comes down to what you're actually selling a customer you know it, it that might not actually still hold true by that point so it's uh the the, the results look pretty awesome we're getting much bigger uh flowering plants but we got to make sure that translates into uh you know jarable or processable product down the line yeah and then also Testing the final bud to see what sort of cannabinoid expression you're getting too, I think is important with terpene levels and see, cause those, those will all change with lighting spectrum. That's fairly well established. So yes, exactly. Um, so. The hypothesis is that we'll see an improvement in all of that too. And I want to give credit to, uh, Outco and Dr. Allison justice, because this is a, this is an experiment they've already done using uh, fluence lighting, looking at an ROI compared to HPS, uh, that's a study they completed, oh, I think two, three years ago, and that's available as well, I believe. Um, so this is sort of a replication of that in a different facility to hopefully support what what that data already showed. Right. Again, it, it's all about just supporting previous data that's been there or refuting it. And if, if you're refuting it, then you're going to, you, know, you want to figure out what the differences are. And if you can control those, great. If not, then you know, you go from there, but it's, it's all, it, everybody is just trying to figure out the best way to, to do the same thing. And it's, it's great to, to actually have, you know, some of these scientists and other, other folks that are so committed to the, to the plant to, to start to, to, to hone in on it. It's really, it's really exciting. Very cool. Well, Ben, we're getting a little long on this podcast and we haven't even gotten to the thing that I'm most excited about announcing. So one of the things that's happened in the past, oh, well, let's say six to eight months now, uh, Ben, myself, and uh, Nathan Gibbs, who's the owner of Goldleaf, have formed a separate company. Uh, it's, it's called Kaizen Consulting. Do you want to talk a little about what Kaizen means? Yeah, Kaizen uh, comes from the, uh, the old Japanese manufacturing methodology of, of continuous improvement, right? So just like we're doing now with testing different things and different products and, and gold leaf's been kind of the forefront on this is, is we just want to continuously improve, you know, much like your podcast, right? The, just the, the cultivation of cannabis. So what Kaizen is, is basically that kind of philosophy put into, um, put into a business, a, a consulting business. Yeah. I'm so excited about this because I, I get requests almost daily uh, for consulting, whether it's about soil or facility design or, or, or just a variety of questions from literally all over the world. It's pretty amazing, uh, mostly because of this podcast. And frankly, I didn't feel qualified to offer uh, a, a consulting on a lot of things. I know what I know and I know what I don't know. And so yeah. the opportunity to partner with uh, Nate, who has been running you know, facilities multiple hundred light grows for, oh, geez, decades now. He's, yeah, he's been really doing it been from back in the medical days. And he's been successful at it in a very, very challenging Washington market where a lot of people are failing. Uh, they've created, you know, the this, this brand, this high-end brand based on the consistency and quality of their flower where they're still getting top dollar. And uh, it, it's pretty amazing. And I think a lot of that is the the uh, communities created there, the, the worker community, the, um, the thoughtfulness he's put into both the cultivation and the marketing of the product. And I love it because he's always sending me these books to read and, and quoting these other books. He's all continuously learning and it really fits with the name of the consulting group. And, and Ben is really bringing 
the uh, the research and science aspect to it so that we're able to start collecting data and, and have data driven answers for people that are coming to me and coming to us as a, as a consulting group. So super excited for that. The idea behind like what I want to make sure we contribute to the whole operation here, the whole kind of collective think tank that is growing cannabis is I, I don't, I don't want to come up with something that says, Oh, this, this product's great without having a graph or some kind of data or some kind of trial or study to say, why this product is great or why this product isn't great. I mean, ultimately, again, it is up to whatever farm or garden to make up their own mind. But, you know, they're, with this market coming online so rapidly and what everyone, I think, is assuming to be so massively is that you're going to start to see a lot of things being sold that will promise so many different things. And we're already seeing that some of these things do work and some of these things we don't see, you know, at least in the way we do things, what they claim to do. So what we want to make sure is we want to continuously improve how things are grown, if it can be in organic, sustainable fashion, that's all the better, and which of these new products that are coming online from all these different companies are going to make that happen um, in the most kind of economical and, like I said, sustainable way. Yeah. So if you're listening to this podcast, you've probably heard my voice way too much and you know, kind of my opinions and thoughts. Uh, you've now heard a little bit from Ben. Uh, I did do a podcast with Nate Gibbs. You can actually watch that one on YouTube. You can see us. We're in a coffee shop chatting. Uh, not so much about the, the cultivation aspect of things, but more about like lean manufacturing, lean farming and, and some of the other aspects of running a business. Uh, but that's an interesting podcast. And then we found that there were still gaps in sort of our consulting knowledge where we wanted to fill those with the top minds that we knew in the industry. And so we've partnered uh, with Dr. Allison Justice, who's amazing and has done some d- done some real work for this industry. Uh, you can listen to her podcast uh, on, the, on the show as well. And then also Chris Jagger. So Allison really has a lot of experience now with hemp and extraction and uh, cultivating um, as sustainably as, as you can with using, you know, chemical nutrients in sort of this multi-tier LED, um, vertical, vertical growing systems. And then, uh, Chris Jagger is really experienced in sort of outdoor hemp production. That's where, that's where he, he came from the, uh, agricultural side of things, growing vegetables and is now doing sort of a combination intercropping with hemp and things like that. So, uh, this team that we found, I'm, I'm really excited about. Um, everyone on it is, is wonderful. And if you're interested, I would I would say please do reach out to us. Uh, ben, you want to give them the website? Yeah, it's uh, www.grow, G-R-O-W, with, W-I-T-H, Kaizen, K-A-I-Z-E-N.com. So yeah, there's a form right there on the front page. You can read a little bit about our bios, but if you fill out that form, uh, someone will be reaching out to you shortly to uh, answer any questions. Was there anything else you wanted to add about the about the white papers or about Kaizen or anything else going on? And I'll, I'll put links to everything that's available right now on the podcast page too for people. I don't think so. I mean, I'm the same. I'm, I'm extremely excited to be, you know, a part of it. And it's, it's, it's really inspiring being around, you know, folks like you, Tad, who are so passionate about cannabis and soil and biology and folks like Nate, who are so passionate about everything that they do. And I mean, that's, you, that totally comes through and in, in the products that comes from gold leaf and all the gardeners and, and, and folks that work there and have worked there for so long. And, uh, I'm really, I'm really excited to be kind of, you know, part of this whole team and, and, and I'm looking forward to helping other folks, you know, as we like to say, uh, grow with Kaizen. Thanks, Ben. I appreciate you coming on tonight and I, uh, look forward to seeing and talk to you soon. Awesome, Todd. Thanks for having me. That was Dr. Ben Higgins, chief research scientist with Goldleaf Gardens and one of my partners in Kaizen Consulting. You are listening to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I posted the white paper we discussed on the podcast on our website blog page. Just go to www.kisorganics.com and click on the blog link. And if you're interested in consulting, you can go to www.growwithkaizen.com. That's G-R-O-W-W-I-T-H. 
K-A-I-Z-E-N.com to learn more. Thanks for listening.